Now, last week, I began to speak with you about identity. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for the good word of the Lord. Father, I pray today for precious Holy Spirit to break and distribute your word to each and every one of us as we have need. Father, young and old, Lord, regardless of how long we've been in service to you, Father, I pray for Holy Spirit to speak to each of us exactly what we need to hear this day in the name of Jesus. And Father, we give you the glory, the honor, the praise, the thanksgiving in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So last week, click the screen if you would, Samuel, please, sir. So last week, there we go. Last week, we talked about how David perceived in his heart that he was king. This was like 40 years in from the time that he had been anointed by the prophet Samuel, the last of the judges, to be king over Israel. And all of a sudden, as God was blessing his kingdom, he had this revelation, this understanding, this realization, and he perceived in his heart that he was king. He had been king. But he had this identity shift in his life where it became revelation of who God had called him to be and that he was actually walking in the calling of God. And I related that to our lives and how in our lives we really need to see a shift in the body of Christ in America to understanding who God has called us to be, that our identity is hid with God in Christ, that it should no longer be we who are seen, but a reflection of Jesus in and through our lives. Amen? And I want to continue into part two of that here this morning. And some months ago, I spoke to you guys about Gideon. I think it's been about two months. I'm not reteaching about Gideon and all that transpired, but I am taking the first part of the story of Gideon, and I want to show you something that we simply glazed over two months ago as we talk about identity. Now, why is identity so important? Because I think identity is the difference between a believer walking like God has purposed and planned for their life and a believer just going through churchianity and going through religious ritual. I think the thing that separates the first century church from the year 2022 in America is I think the first century church didn't have all the stuff we have, but what they did have is they had a revelation or they were gaining a revelation of who they were in Messiah. And they walked it out. When they saw somebody sick, they knew God was able to heal. So they prayed for him. They were led of the Holy Spirit. They brought Jesus wherever they went, even in the midst of horrible circumstances. Persecution, they didn't give up on church. They didn't give up on God. They didn't stop fellowshipping together because some of them were being fed to the lions or being lit as garden tiki torches in Nero's gardens like happened, right? So they didn't say, you know what, it's too dangerous, so we're not going to fellowship. We're going to wait till the persecution subsides, then we'll come back together. No, that's 20th century Christianity. That's not first century Christianity. First century Christianity said, hey, our commitment is first and foremost to our Savior who gave his life for me and died for me. My identity is completely and totally hid in him. And to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen? So I pick up the story here this morning in Judges chapter 6, verse 11. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Orpha, which belonged to Joash the Abizite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide from the Midianites. Now listen. This was during the time of Judges. There was no king over the nation of Israel. And the Midianites had enslaved the people of Israel. Enslaved them to the point where they had to give their food to the Midianites to sustain them. Maybe you'd have enough left for you and your family to keep you from starving till the next crop. And it was during this season, during this time, Gideon is threshing wheat. You see, normally wheat was threshed on top of a hill where there's wind, kind of like you all have seen where the, uh, 
we've got our wind turbines, right? Y'all know they put them in a high spot where the wind's blowing? That would be like the perfect ideal threshing place if you're threshing wheat. Of course, you toss the wheat up, the chaff would be blown, and the grain would fall. But that's not where you find Gideon, no. You find Gideon instead threshing wheat in a wine press. It was down in a place that couldn't be seen that had very little breeze or air moving across it. It'd be like the worst place to thresh wheat. But he was there in order to hide the food, the grain, from the Midianites. And now you have an angel of the Lord, and I love this. Listen, God is never in an anxious state of mind. Someone say amen. Men, we get all anxious. Women, ladies, we get all anxious. God is not anxious about the body of Christ. He's not anxious about the world's condition. Doesn't mean he likes it, but he's not anxious. He's not stressed on the throne of God. The whole thing, you can read how it ends. You ever like skip forward? You read Revelation chapter 21, chapter 22, beautiful ending, amen? But God's not in a situation where he's stressed. I love this because the angel of the Lord, he's just chilling, sitting under a tree. Now, I'll be honest with you, I believe, and I have lots of reason to believe, that the Old Testament, that the angel of the Lord was the pre-incarnate Messiah. That was Jesus before he had a human body. I have lots of reasons to believe that, but I don't want to teach you on that today. But I will tell you this, that this angel of the Lord's chilling out Gideon's fearful for the Midianites threshing weed in the wine press. Fear and anxiety and security were all traits of Gideon at this time. He's threshing wheat as he hides out. Have you ever been there in your life where you're operating out of a spirit of fear and anxiety instead of trying to find the purpose and plan from God and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit for your life? How many of you know when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, his purpose, his plan, there's a lot more peace there. Amen? A lot more peace. And how many of you know that God's never late? Can we all say amen? Let me say that again. Our Heavenly Father is never late. He's always just in the nick of time. Amen? <clears throat> he's just not on our timing, but he's never late. And so Gideon, we're going to see what was going through his mind here in a moment. The Lord does not see you as you see yourself. Thank God for that. Amen? We must allow the word of God to establish our identity and not our past nor our character flaws to establish who you and I are today. Now, how many of you know if you're a human being, you have character flaws? The only perfect human being on this earth was Jesus, and I'm not him and you're not him. Someone say amen. So what does that mean? That means that you and I have got to stop tripping on our past. Amen? That means you have to allow the Word of God to establish who your identity and who you are today in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God. Amen? And once you do, it will change what the Lord's able to do through your life. See, when I look at Pastor Brian, and, you know, here you have, and I can brag on him, he's not here, <coughs> Here you have a man who's committed to the Lord, but he recognizes that he can't live his life based on the mistakes of the past. And he's allowing the Holy Spirit to do with him today. And the more he allows Holy Spirit to do that, the more he's doing, the more God gives him to do. Amen? And that's an example for all of us because I've said it before and I've said it again by the Spirit of God that the time has come where no longer is it going to be men of renown and men of uh, a great stature who are leading the body of Christ in evangelism in America. It's going to be the everyday men and women, the mom, the dad, the single housewife, the, 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 the single man who are reflecting Jesus to a world that's lost and without hope and without God and are seeing the miracles of God transpire through their lives. That's what it's going to be, Amen. Now back to Judges chapter 6 in the story of Gideon. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Okay, got up from under the tree where he was hanging out watching. Goes, appears before Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, 
you mighty man of valor. Now, how many of you think Gideon thought, yes, that's who I am. How'd you know that? Or how many of you think Gideon, at this time, honestly, he didn't even know it was an angel of the Lord. He's kind of scratching his head, looking around like, who are you talking to? Are you talking to me? Listen, when you read the word of God and you hide his word in your heart, and you begin to get revelation and understanding of who Heavenly Father says He's made you to be in Christ, all of a sudden, your identity shifts, and you're like, oh my goodness, you did all this for me. The level of gratitude in your life just goes way up here. All the complaining, I know y'all never complain, but I do sometimes. All the complaining goes away, because as you begin to have a heart of gratitude, as you recognize what Jesus is doing and has done for your life and how he sees you today, not all the past mistakes, but how he sees you today, your life hid with God in Christ, then all of a sudden you recognize that, man, there is nothing God can't do for you. Nothing. Everybody say nothing. Gideon did not see himself at this point in his life as a mighty man of valor. Amen? He just didn't see himself. He's hiding from the Midianites. He's not like being bold, threshing on the mountain, say, hey, look at me, Midianites. Come get me if you dare. No, he's hiding out. Mighty man. I love this. I looked it up. And it literally means champion, warrior, strong in the Hebrew. The Lord did not see Gideon as how he was, but rather who Gideon would become, who he would become. I love that, amen? You see, so often when we come across other people, even believers, even within the congregation, try not to see people as they are today, but see them with the eyes of the Lord and ask him to help you of who they can become in Christ if they'll yield and submit their life to precious Holy Spirit. Someone say amen. And when they do that, man, God transforms them and changes them. Amen? Because I'll tell you, as a kid, I was a goof up and a mess up. If y'all had known me then, you would have said, there is no way God could use him to ever do anything, especially pastor a church. I mean, I was the guy coming in with the muffler hanging on the ground. I don't know why I didn't just tie it up. Sparks flying everywhere. I mean, I was just a goof-up, lost child when I came to Jesus. But thank God, over the course of time and experience, Holy Spirit transformed my life and showed me, this is not who I see you, Bruce. I see you like this. And then that becomes revelation, and you begin to live out what the Spirit of God says about you. As a man thinks in his heart, Proverbs says, so is he. Amen? When we perceive our identity through Christ, it allows you and I to be used mightily of God. Now, some of you are like, why do I want to be used of God? Listen, (laughs) you and I have a lot of work to do in this life. Amen? And it's not that God needs you, God wants you. Heard a famous evangelist one time. You'll like this, Jay. This famous evangelist one time said that if God didn't use him to evangelize the lost, the lost would never get evangelized. But I want you to know that God can use a donkey. Amen? He wants to use you and me, but the job's going to get done regardless because he's God. Amen? But he wants to. You see, that's the difference. All of a sudden now, wow, Lord, I get to partner with you. Amen? Get to, there's no pride in that. There's humility. There's, there's thanksgiving. There's gratitude. I get to partner with the King of kings and Lord of lords in what he wants to do in these last days. He wants to do it through his people. Wants to do it through you. Amen? But you see, a lot of people don't want to be used of God. What they want is they want a hymn on Sunday morning, a scripture and then come back next week, put it on repeat, and do it again. And you and I, I'm telling you, God's raising up disciples. 
And it's the remnant within the body of Christ, not just here, but all over the world and all over America, this remnant that God is raising up that says, hey, the days of churchianity are over. Holy Spirit's raising up men and women of faith who are going to be true followers and disciples of the rabbi. Amen? Following in the dust of his feet. Hallelujah. That's what I want for my life. That's what the Lord wants for your life. Then the Lord turned to Gideon and said to him, Go in this might of yours. We skip down to verse 14. And you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? You see, in verse 13, and you can read it on your own time, Gideon's asking, Lord, where are the miracles that I heard about, that our fathers talked about when you brought them out of the land of Egypt? Where are those miracles, God? And the Lord replies for him to go and save Israel. Now that's kind of mind-blowing, right? God, where's your miracles? And the Lord said, hey, Gideon, you go. I'm calling you. You see, I'm going to be blunt with y'all. How many of you know the scripture where the Lord saying, says in the word of God to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the field for the harvest is white? It's already ready, right? Listen, you cannot pray for laborers to go into the field without Holy Spirit starting to work in your heart and say, hey, like Isaiah, Lord, here am I, send me. Amen. All of a sudden, your heart becomes open to do whatever God wants you to do. Amen. Doesn't mean he's going to send you off to Zimbabwe. Amen. Though it could. But you're not going to Zimbabwe or northern Iraq like Pastor Brian until you're faithful right where you're at. Holy Spirit didn't send that man to those countries until he showed he was faithful with what God had given him right here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Someone say amen. Told you guys the story of the person who wants to be a missionary but can't tell their next door neighbor about Jesus. You think it's going to be easier in another country? No. It's going to be harder. You don't know the people. You don't know the culture. All right, let's keep going. Too often we want to pass responsibility to God, but he by his spirit wants to empower you and I to be used by him to bring miracles and deliverance to the lives of people. Instead of, God, where's all of your miracles that you promised and did in days past in America, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, you go, you preach the gospel. You preach deliverance to the captive and recovering of sight to the blind. You set at liberty those that are bruised and preach and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. You go and I will be with you, lo, unto the ends of the earth. Isn't that what Jesus said? But you see, personal responsibility is not our strong suit in America today. It's everybody else's fault. Church's fault, preacher's fault, Bible's fault, God's fault, everybody's fault but our own. And I'm telling you what, guys, Holy Spirit wants to cut through all that mess. And he wants to say, hey, once you recognize who I've made you, not who I'll make you, who I've made you to be, and you start walking in that, your life is going to be transformed forever. And you have people, even within this own congregation, they go through the same stuff over and over and over again, and their lives are never changed. You see, we still have this thing called free will. Everybody say free will. Free will. Choice. Every day you and I have to choose to submit to him. But every day you submit to him, he'll pour out his spirit and say, son, daughter, let me show you now what I can do for you. And listen, let me tell you, how many of you have ever been working a secular job before and your boss asked you to do something and it kind of made you feel good that they asked you? Okay? How much better do you think it is when you're walking through life and the Holy Spirit gives you a responsibility, gives you a task, gives you a purpose and a plan? Now, all of a sudden, your life is not purposeless. Amen? Some people think their purpose in life is to, uh, what, make money, eat, drink, be merry, and then we die, right? 
But God has far more purpose because you can't bring anything with you. And we know that. Amen. And eating and drinking only lasts for a moment. The next day you're hungry again, right? Thirsty again. But the true riches that God has promised to us in Christ, he's already given it to us. He's done all he's going to do through Jesus. Now it's up to you and I to gain that identity shift and begin to realize and recognize, Lord, maybe I've been viewing myself based on these satanic whispers in my ear instead of based on who the word of God says my identity is with Christ. What does that even mean? Judges 6.22, now Gideon, I love this, now Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. It took him a while to get it, didn't it? Now I can't blame Gideon because had I been in his shoes, I may not have perceived it was an angel of the Lord himself as well. But all of a sudden, he has this understanding that, wait a minute, this is not a normal man I'm speaking with. In verse 15 above, he had said, look, Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. His perception of himself was as weak. He's from the least of the Hebrew children. God, how can you use me? And the Lord's response is, he can use anybody he chooses to use. And he wants to use you. He chose Gideon because he saw something Gideon, Gideon couldn't see in himself. Holy Spirit sees something in you you don't see. What is it? Ask him. He'll show you. Somebody came to me once, Pastor, I have no talents. I have no giftings. I said, that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Holy Spirit's given all of us giftings. You may not recognize what it is, but you've got them. You've got them. Amen? It may be administrative. It may be organization. It may be hospitality. It may be a gift to give. Whatever it is, he's given you something to do something with. If nothing else, he's given you the gift of life. And if you have life, you have lungs. And if you have lungs, you have breath. And if you have breath, you have a tongue. And if you have a tongue, you can speak to share good news with someone else. Someone say amen. amen. So at this point in their conversation, Gideon perceives, remember David perceived in his heart that he was king? At this moment, Gideon perceived, understood, had this revelation <laughs> that this is the angel of the Lord he's speaking with. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. David perceived he was king, and Gideon perceived that it was an angel of the Lord speaking and prophesying over him. And I'm here to tell you when the Holy Spirit changes your perception and gives you understanding, gives you revelation of what Holy Spirit can do through your life, it will change you. But some of you still say, it's almost like I can hear you, well, I'm not sure I want God to do anything through my life. Well, that's the first thing you need to change there. Amen? Why wouldn't you want the Lord to use you, even if it's a small way? God can take small ways and turn them into big ways. Amen? Somebody's in a wheelchair or handicapped, and all they can do is pray, then bless God, pray. Amen? Use whatever it is that the Lord gave you. Do you not think that there's old grandmas who have passed on and gone home to be with Jesus who maybe all they ever did was intercede on behalf of this nation and on behalf of the churches of this nation? You don't think that they have a reward in heaven? Of course they do. So everybody's doing their part, but you have to desire to be used of Holy Spirit. Amen? We've got to get out of this me, me congregation member, them preacher, preacher does everything, congregation member throws money in the bucket, does nothing. That's never been the Bible's model. That's America's model of the church. That is not God's model. God's model is for the fivefold ministry, a past, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, to train you and teach you so that you can do the work of the ministry. And it doesn't mean the work of full-time ministry. It means the work of being a reflection of Jesus to someone who doesn't know Jesus. We talked about that in Sunday school, amen? All right. 
your perception about the Lord's view of you can change your life and keep you from wallowing in the mud of your past. Someone say amen. How many of you guys have mud in your past? Now, it doesn't matter if that mud was quicksand. <laughs> doesn't matter if that mud was just shallow or if it was like five feet deep. You're not in the mud anymore. Last time I checked, you and I are on the rock of our salvation. He's our fortress and our high tower. So we're on a rock, amen? So don't trip over the mud of your past. You and I need to walk with who God says you are today, amen? You meet somebody that knew you in your past. I'm not that person anymore. I sound like him and look like him, but inside I am completely different. Amen? Somebody say completely different. I love this. This is A.W. Tozer. I love A.W. Tozer. Some great books out there if you're looking to ever get in some extra reading. He said this. He said, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only those things that we can do by ourselves. You mean God wants to do the impossible through you? Yes. Well, he can do the impossible. We'll let him do it through the preacher, not through me. No, that's the mentality we have to get rid of. Amen? Everybody say amen. amen. He wants to do his will through your life. Amen? Through your life. And I want to train you. I want to equip you. I want to teach you. The other staff and pastors, we want to train them they want to train you. They want to teach you. Amen? We want everybody doing their part that God's called them to be. That's the body of Christ. One is a pinky. Some of us might be a gallbladder. <laughs> but even though it can be painful, you still need it. Amen? <laughs> Some of you are a big toe. Some of us might be the mouth. Shh. Some of us are all different parts, but it's all those many different parts working together that we begin to represent who Jesus wants to be to this community, to this city, and to this world. Amen? I had somebody say, oh, pastor, we're not a 5,000-person church, like church down the road. I don't want to be a 5,000-member church. I want to be, I'd rather have 150, 200 disciples of the Lord who are walking out their faith with Jesus every day. Amen? Listen, and I'm not against crowds, but I want you to know, even in this place, not everybody who calls on the name of the Lord is really a disciple. All right, let's keep going before I chase a rabbit. Matthew 26. Now, we talked about Gideon having this crazy revelation from this angel of the Lord that he was a mighty man of valor, that he was going to save Israel, that God was going to be with him to do this, blew his mind. God confirmed it through all these miracles. But how many of you know Gideon became what? A mighty man of valor. He became exactly who God said he was. And that's how I hope and pray one day before the throne of God each of you will be able to say, hey, Lord, I became exactly who you purposed and planned for me to be in my life. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So the last thing I want to talk about here this morning, the last person of identity, real quick, is Peter. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard. We're in Matthew chapter 26, 69 through 75. Peter sat outside in the courtyard. Jesus had been arrested. A servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. And he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. When he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Now what was causing him to deny the Lord? One thing he didn't love God, it was fear Fear, fear, fear. Amen? Listen, fear can cause a lot of 
shifting of our identity into the wrong direction in our life. Amen. We've got to rid of ourselves of fear and anxiety. We're not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. We are not ashamed. We're not fearful. We're not afraid of the good news of Jesus. It's the power of God into salvation. Get that into your heart. Amen. And so Peter is fearful because Jesus was arrested. He's thinking he's going to be arrested. He said, this fellow, she said, also is with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied it with an oath and said, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came and said to Peter, surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. She could tell he was from the region of Galilee. You ever hear anybody from East Texas talk? Now, I moved here from East Texas. It took me a while to get over that one. Because I had like that. I went from Central Texas. My wife and I went from Central Texas to East Texas to West Texas. And the accent's different everywhere. And especially in East Texas. I mean, it's the only place I know where Sprite's a four-syllable word. Do you have any Sprite? <laughs> Oh, I could tell you stories, but I didn't mean to, but when I moved here, I was speaking like an East Texan. It rubbed off on me. And so every now and then, I still catch myself. Sprite. So listen to me. So this person right here had come to Peter, and Peter had denied the Lord three times. And Jesus had already prophesied to Peter this was going to happen. Remember, he said, oh, God. Jesus, I would never deny you, remember? The Lord said, hey, before the cock crows, you're going to have denied me three times. Then he, Peter, began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. Can you imagine what this must have done to Peter's identity after the resurrection of Jesus? Think about it for a minute. Here he was, he had denied the Lord. Now Judas had sold him out, but he had denied him three times after he'd said he would never die. Lord, I'm willing to die for you. And the Lord said, hey, before a cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, Jesus, I never would do that. Now I'm not messing with Peter, but I want you to know, listen, Peter could have lost the entire purpose and plan for God in his life had he lived out the rest of his life with that obsession over his mistakes? Someone say amen. You cannot obsess over your mistakes of the past. If the Lord Jesus has forgiven you of them, why do you keep remembering them? Now I know part of it's the devil whispering in our ear, but you and I have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Click the screen, please, Samuel. Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Now, I just want you to feel for a moment what he must have been feeling. He was like, man, the Lord knew I was going to do this and told me ahead of time, and I did it anyway, and I've walked with him for three years I'm a failure. How many of you think Peter felt like a failure right here? He felt like he'd wasted three years of his life, failed himself, and failed God. And I want you to know that had he not brushed off his knees, gotten up, and gone on with God, he never would have accomplished the purpose and plan that God had for him. Peter denied the Lord three times and could have spent the rest of his life living in regret and tripping over his past, just like some of us do. Peter would have had to accept his had to accept his new identity in Christ and allow his past to be past at last. You've got to accept who Jesus has excuse me has made you to be, man. You, I can't accept it for you. I can preach it. I can teach it until I'm blue in the face. But it has to be where you perceive in your heart that you're a son and daughter of the Most High God. You have to perceive it. You have to understand. It has to become life and living water and revelation to you that your life is hid with God in Christ. The Lord Jesus helped Peter 
and will help us also to move forward from the past. Peter needed an identity shift. How many of you here today need an identity shift? John 21 in closing, verse 15 through 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, now this is fast forward, few days, three days, Jesus been resurrected from the dead. He shows up. He's cooking breakfast for the boys. Remember, Peter hops in, swims to meet him. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah. Remember, Peter's got all this regret, all this, I feel like a failure. I've lost the purpose of God. But Jesus says to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love, and that word love there is agape, do you agape me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord. Now, I'm not sure if he was actually saying, do you love me more than these other disciples more love me? Or if he was saying, do you love me more than you love these others? But either way, he said, do you agape me? More than these, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love phileo you. In the Greek, different words for love. Now follow me. He said to him, feed my lambs. What's a lamb? A lamb is a baby sheep. Baby sheep in the kingdom of God are new believers. Everybody say new believers. Jesus is reaffirming Peter's purpose and plan that he had called him to do and says right here, I still have a purpose and plan for you, Peter. Feed my little ones. Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. Now, isn't it interesting here that he never answers with the word agape. He always answers with the word phileo, and I want to talk about that in a sec. But he says, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. So the first ones feed the baby lambs. And you can look it up in the Greek, it's there. The first one's feed the baby lambs. The other one is take those who have grown to full maturity and take care of them. Tend my sheep. Again, what's he doing? He's reaffirming to Peter his calling that he'd given him. You think you fail, Peter, but I'm able to turn failure and change your identity, not who you were three days ago, but who you are today in me. Amen? And the last time he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love, do you phileo me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. He knew, remember Philip? Unless I put my finger in his hands and put my hand in his side. And then Jesus appeared to them all and said, Philip, come here, put your finger in my hand and your hand in my hand. I mean, he knew, the Lord knew everything. By the way, the Lord knows everything. In case you were wondering. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love phileo you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This didn't feed my lambs. This is the mature ones. I want you to feed them. I want you to take care of them. I want you to feed the little ones. My purpose and plan for you, Peter, has not changed, regardless of your past. So let the past be past at last. Someone say amen. Agape love does not refer to close friendship or brotherly love for which the Greek word philia or phileo is used. See, phileo is close friendship. Remember Church of Philadelphia, brotherly love? But agape love is different. Agape love involves faithfulness, commitment, and act of the will. So Jesus is saying, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter's saying, well, Lord, I phileo you. <laughs> but he's looking for us to change and to turn our identity from one of brotherly love to one that involves faithfulness, commitment, and an act of the will. You see, to agape God is to walk in discipleship. It really is. It's to walk in true discipleship. Total faithfulness, total commitment to the Lord. And every time the Lord asked Peter, do you love me? He said, do you agape me? This involves faithfulness, commitment, act of the will. It's distinguished from the other types of love by its lofty moral nature and strong character. Peter, the Holy Spirit, through Jesus at this moment, is trying to reaffirm Peter's calling and get him back on track 
back to the place of faithfulness and commitment to God. Someone say amen. An agape love, if you want to know more, is beautifully described in 1 Corinthians 13. It's kind, it's patient, doesn't seek its own, it's never jealous, amen, on, on, on. Peter was asked three times about his unconditional agape love for the Lord. Three times Peter responded with the fact that he has affection as a friend for him. And I want you to know that your identity needs to shift. You need to go from having phileo love for God to having agape love, where it involves full and total and complete faithfulness and commitment to what he's called you to do, your purpose and your plan. You say, well, I'm not Peter, I'm not this person. Did you know that God has never done anything through any man that he's not willing to do through all men who are willingly submitted to him? How do I know that? Because the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons. I think that it's possible that the Lord asked this question of Peter at this moment, after eating this fish together, three times to restore Peter to the identity of his calling, reminding him of who he was to be and not what he'd done in the past. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three times. And how many times did our Lord reaffirm his calling in his life? Three times. I don't think that was by accident. I think Peter understood the message the Lord was saying. Regardless, Peter, of your failures of the past, I've called you for such a time as this. This is my purpose, and this is my plan for you. He goes on in that same conversation, we don't have time this morning, to tell Peter how he was going to die. They're going to take you where you don't want to go when you're old, and they're going to string you up upside down and crucify you. Satan whispers in your ear to get you to think that your identity today is based on past failures. And the Lord, by his Holy Spirit, will always remind you that your life is now hidden with Christ and to allow his identity to become yours. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet. We did this last week, and I loved it. I want to do it one more time. I want us to declare, based on the word of God, I want you to repeat after me, we're going to make an identity declaration. Amen? Just in case some of you have forgotten his calling, his plan, his purpose for you. If you're involved in any darkness, in any deceit, in anything, remember that is not the plan of God. That is not how his will is going to be fulfilled in your life. It's going to come through a life given to obedience, commitment, and faithfulness because you love God more than you love anything else. Amen? You agape him. So repeat with me, I am a child of God. Click, Samuel, please. Redeemed by Jesus Christ. Loved, pursued, chosen, and equipped with words of life. Chosen and equipped with words of life. Clothed in strength and dignity. Clothed in strength and dignity. Commissioned here and now. Gifted by the Holy Spirit. Forgiven and unbound. Blessed are those who believe. Hallelujah. Can we give Jesus a hand clap this morning? Hallelujah, Father. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, for the word of God. Altar prayer, guys, if you Prayer ladies, if you'd come forward in Jesus' name. Father, we love you. We magnify you. I thank you for the work of Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives, Lord. Perhaps there be some here today, Lord, who had forgotten who you say they are. And they've been living in the past, Lord God, allowing past failures to haunt them. And you say that the door is open for whom you set free is really free indeed, Lord. Free to live you, live for you, free to serve you, free to see your purposes and plans fulfilled in our hearts and lives. 
With every head bowed, every eye closed, saints praying around the room. If you're here today and you've been allowing the failures of the past to keep you, you believe that they've actually hindered you from what God wants you to do and what the Holy Spirit has for you in your life. I want you to lift your hand to Jesus right now. Be honest, lift it up high. I want to pray for you right where you're at. Leave it up, leave it up, leave it up. Anyone else? I'm going to wait just a minute longer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all those who have lifted up their hand. God bless them for their honesty, Lord. And Father, they've had failures in the past, Lord. They've had darkness. They've had things like all of us have had, Lord. And Lord, some of them have feel like they've tripped over these things. They've allowed these darkness, these disappointments, these failures, Lord, to hinder them, to keep them from walking in faith and victory today, from walking and allowing precious Holy Spirit to accomplish your will through them today, Lord. So today we declare to them that their sin is forgiven in the name of Jesus by the blood of Jesus, you said in your word, Father, that you take their sin and their failures and their disappointments and throw it as far from them as the east is from the west to remember it no more. You throw it into the sea of forgetfulness, Lord, to never dredge it up. Our salvation and forgiveness in Jesus is absolutely and totally complete. Freedom to live in our new identity freedom to live with our life hid with God in Christ. Freedom to walk as you've called us to walk. Free to see your purposes, Father, and your plans. Make this so, Lord. Encourage their hearts by your Holy Spirit today. In the name of